Um, I am very pleased to introduce Christine Sun Kim, an American artist now based in Berlin. Christine was born deaf, and her work in the mediums of performance and in drawing is centered on her own relationship to sound and spoken languages and how to make audible noise perceivable visually, physically, and conceptually. Um, Christine currently has on view a giant billboard commissioned by the Whitney Museum. Um, yep, there. Uh, positioned at the foot of the High Line in New York. And it is based on the hand movement in American Sign Language for the word future, which is two semicircles away from the face. Um, and Christine has drawn these black lines, super thick and massive, and written the words, too much future. Um, that rather existential and humorous text suggests both the optimism and perhaps the anxiety of endless possibilities. Um, in many of her drawings, Christine uses musical notations to show the relationship between the way American Sign Language is transliterated, how you draw signs that can be read, and musical scores, which of course can be interpreted, interpreted in many ways by composers and musicians. Christine is recently a new mother to a baby girl, and is thinking about what it means to raise a child in a, house, in a household with two languages, a child who can hear in a household with two languages. And Christine, can you talk about the sound diet concept that you've come up with and how that is informing your new, your new series of drawings? Sure, thank you. As Hilary just mentioned, I've recently had a baby girl. <laughs> Smiling there. So my daughter, as we said, is hearing. My German partner is hearing. And we were figuring out how we would set up language use at home. And so far, we've decided on four things. Firstly, that my partner would speak to her in German. Secondly, that I would sign in American Sign Language. Thirdly, when I'm present and they're speaking to each other, as I enter a room, that they would begin signing. And finally, we hope that she will pick up English from daycare and everyday surroundings. Now, I found that I got a bit over-concerned and paranoid about how we would raise her in relation to communication. And the reason for this is we live in a, in a world where spoken language is key. And the status, is, the status of languages is with spoken languages. And I've seen that if parents in a mixed deaf and hearing household, if, they don't, if, they're not, if they're not paying enough attention to a fair balance between spoken and signed languages, that in the long term, their hearing children most often favor the spoken language and the balance is out of whack. And so this is the process in how I came up with the concept of a sound diet for my baby. But it can be applied to anyone, not only infants and children. So I like to imagine myself as a doctor advising people on different amounts of listening. Similar to a way a doctor advises on the amounts of sugar or salt or a well-balanced diet and exercise. In the same way, I, my new series um, is about the suggested amounts of listening for different social and communicative situations. And this, this strategy enables me to better control how much sound my baby consumes on a daily basis. So first, let me, and I, I, you, I, I would like to show this to you using musical notes as well. So I'll start with showing one musical note. This is the symbol that I often employ. Um, as, a, as an actual musical note. And the P stands for piano, which means quiet. So if a P comes up in a musical score, the musician knows to play quieter. Similarly, if there are two Ps, pianissimo, it indicates to play even quieter. And the emphasis increases with the number of Ps employed. 
The next slides are from a recent, I, I recently made these three, a new series three weeks ago. So this is in terms of what we use at home when you're on a laptop. So this is the suggested amount of listening to Spotify on laptop when a baby is in close proximity. And this is a measurement of one day. In the top left, we're talking about the beginning of the day, you know, when the baby wakes up in the morning, you know, five or six, it's insane, I know. Um, and then all the way through to the end of the day at the bottom right. You know, bedtime, the end of the day. This is the suggested amount of watching Netflix with the volume up when a baby <laughs> is in close proximity. <laughs> Since becoming a mum, I've been watching a lot of Netflix. I've become slightly addicted. So whatever you consume auditorily, the baby is consuming that as well. And, and being aware of that, and so it is really, you need to be mindful of that. So in the morning, my partner is a morning, it has the morning shift. I don't have that. I'm not a morning person. I'm a night owl. So when he wakes up, he's playing with the baby, making sound, watching the television, and I'm asleep. But when I wake up, I want things to get quieter. I want the sound to decrease, and that's representative in here that you can see with the peas emerging. The suggested amount of listening to YouTube on a laptop when a baby is in close proximity. <laughs> I'd like to show you a few more that these are still uh, baby related. These are four babies. No, no, this is a big drawing. It's about 1.5 by 1.5 meters square. So I just wanted to, it's very large. <laughs> and it shows the indication of a day being longer as well. This is the suggested amount of spoken language with a baby whose parents communicate in sign language. And this is about my personal space. As someone enters my home, and I want them to pay attention to how I've set up language use, and when they come in, I'd like that to, them to follow how we are communicating. Out in, the, the, out in public spaces, it's a different situation. This is the suggested amount of getting a baby's attention by waving hands or stomping on floor instead of using voice. Everyone has an identity, a, 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 a sonic identity. And everyone has a different one. And it's how it, so for my baby, I, with my sonic identity, I want to be stomping my feet and waving my hands, not using a voice. So this is representative of my sonic identity. The suggested amount of allowing friends to sing songs to a baby. I'm a sound artist. I have many musician friends, and that's not surprising. And some of them have asked, can we sing to your baby? And it's nice, I find that nice that they've considered asking me. And so I've added it to my sound diet, how I've made those decisions. The suggested amount of sound toys for a baby to play with. You've all experienced as parents, you get a lot of gifts when your baby arrives. And I've noticed that there's a, a, a huge amount of, of sensory input from the sound toys, the toys that have added sound to my baby, and I want her to just be able to chill out, so I've, I've put those on the sound diet. <laughs> Suggested amount of allowing grandmother to play Korean opera <laughs> on phone for a baby. I mean, you know grandparents, right? So you might have deaf friends or signers that you know, and so this is in relation to when deaf people are around. This is the suggested amount of a spoken language at a deaf person's home. And you've noticed there's one note, because I'd prefer there was none, really, but I've put it, you know, prefer there was no spoken language, but this is the suggested amount of spoken language in a public space in the presence of a deaf person. You see a lot of notes on here, because outside in a public space, I don't care. The suggested amount of overlapping voices in the presence of a deaf person. When I'm working with interpreters or I'm sitting and having a conversation and voices are overlapping, it's, it's very helpful if that were to decrease a bit and people were to have turn-taking in their conversations. The suggested amount of spoken group conversation in the presence of a deaf person during dinner. It's the same as, very similar to the previous slide. Suggested amount of baby talking with voice in the presence of a deaf person. It's interesting. 
people coming, I find it strange that people come and talk to my baby in front of me. I'd like to see less of that in my home. Now, when I was assembling these slides and putting them together, I noticed a mistake. Have you seen it? Have you spotted it now? <laughs> I think it might be time for a mummy joke. Um, so I'd like to sometimes become a fly on the wall and to see if people are, are actually following the rules of my sound diet or not. <laughs> so this is the suggested amount of talking on phone in the presence of a deaf person. So I've set up a rule with my partner, and so whenever he's talking on the phone and I come in, I, he lets me know who he's speaking to, and then he leaves the room. So that shows the shift of the noise leaving the room when I enter. The next group is about passive listening. I've noticed that people often passively listening, something goes in one ear and out the other. Hence the following drawings. Suggested amount of music in background while interneting in the morning. I mean, we all know interneting is an addiction. Suggested amount of watching golf on television with volume up during breakfast. My family are big golf fans. The suggested amount of listening to radio during a road trip from A to B. Now, when I, I don't mind if the radio is on when I'm napping in a trip during a trip, but when I wake up, I want it off so that you can see that here. The suggested amount of listening to music on the metro during rush hour. You see a lot of 116th notes here, it's because again, I don't care, it doesn't matter, people can do what they want, it's a public space. Really, maybe I'm actually curating a sound diet for myself. Of course, my partner and I don't strictly adhere to these drawings, but it has really helped us stay mindful of how much sounds everyone produces and consumes on a daily basis. <laughs> oh no, my baby ate my homework. <laughs> really, maybe she's showing that she disagrees with the sound diet. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. That's it. <laughs> Um, any questions out there for her? You have silenced the art world. <laughs> um, I have a question. How, how difficult or not difficult has it been to navigate a career in the art world as a deaf person and an emerging artist? <laughs> Really, that would require a long answer, but I do have an example. I've traveled a lot all over the world. And just one bit of information, just thing I'd like to put into the audience of museum directors and, and the various people we have here. The word accessibility can be an ugly one. I wish it wasn't. I wish it could be positive more. So when I need to request interpreters, often universities or institutions say, oh, you're not a student, or you don't fit into our budget, or really a lot of bullshit reasons. Um, there's a lot of red tape around that. And I can't access that, right? I can't get into that world because of all of that. So curators have to find the budget from a different, a, a different place, rather than an accessibility budget. So why not get rid of that system of accessibility budgets and just have an overall, maybe, operations costs budget? And then you would see it would be less about me and more about your job and everyone's job and a shared responsibility. That's just an idea I'd like to pose out there to the, to the people in this room. And, and that's just how I see it in general, just a simple example. Yeah, that's great. Thank you.